All right, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. We're going to get started. If you could find a seat, because there are some seats left, so please feel free to have a seat. Um, my name is Melissa Lindbergh. I am a chair of Northside Democracy for America, and I'm honored to play your moderator tonight. Uh, the first person I'm going to introduce is the host for the evening, uh, Denise Davis, who is uh, running for alderman in the 46th Ward and happens to be a Northside Democracy for America endorsed candidate. Good evening, and thank you for coming. The reason why I am running for alderman, and quite a few people ask me, is because I feel there's a real disconnect in the 46th Ward. I feel that everyone is being painted with a broad brush. And I think, even though we might not have any kumbaya moments, I think that it's possible for all of us to sit down at the table and come up with a win-win situation. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me if you're black, if you're white, red, yellow, or brown. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me if you are a condo owner, live in one of our fabulous mansions, live in moderate uh, rental housing, and or live in subsidized housing, or even homeless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me if you are straight, gay, tra transgender. It doesn't matter. What does matter to me is that we all have a voice, and it's clear that we do not have one now. There should not be a reason why someone on Magnolia should make decisions on someone who lives on Stratford. We have to pull together. I feel that we can unify a little bit better than what is being done now or even in the past. I want to be your alderman because I want to hear your voice. I want to include each and every person has a say about whatever happens in your neighborhood, whatever happens on your block. And I definitely want to include young people because I think now is a time that young people always have had a, a voice, but nobody's listening to them. And that's part of the problem. I want to bring real programs into the ward, programs with teeth, programs with substance, real job fears with real employers that are actually hiring. I want to be your alderman because I think and I know that Uptown is the beauty of it, is a diversity. We have an eclectic, uh, eclectic diversity that no one has in the city of Chicago. I want to be your alderman. I'm asking for your support and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. It's me a great honor to introduce Karen Lewis, the president of the CTU. Uh, Chicago Teachers Union President Karen Lewis has dedicated her life to fighting for the right of all families to live, learn, and prosper in safe and healthy communities. As CTU president, Karen has stood side by side with working families to champion a living wage, public investment, and economic development for all communities the accountable use of taxpayer dollars, an elected school board, an end to failed school closings, and ethical and honest government. Karen is committed to democracy, inclusion, e equity, and believes that we need elected officials who will hear from all Chicagoans and bring communities together to develop solutions to our fiscal problems. A lifelong Chicagoan and alumna, of Kenwood High School, Karen's commitment to community comes from her parents, both Chicago public schools teachers, the only African American woman, and one of the few women at that time, to graduate from uh, Dartmouth College. Karen taught high school chemistry and CPS for over 20 years before becoming president of the 30,000 member teachers, Chicago Teachers Union in 2010. She lives in Bronzeville with her husband, John Lewis, a retired CPS teacher. Thank you, Melissa. That's very nice. I love how people find more stuff to say about me. It's very kind. 
time. Um, and thank you for having me in the 46th Ward. I mean, it's, it's a privilege. People don't realize that um, it's not easy. People don't have to pull this together and find some place and have some place where people's voices can be heard. Um, what I find the most interesting is the possibility of what can happen if we seriously talk about changing the political landscape in Chicago. And what we can talk about is what works in every neighborhood is democracy. It is. Democracy works everywhere. Now, is it tough? Is it difficult? Absolutely. But it is worth it. What I see throughout this country is more and more and more voter suppression. But don't be fooled and think it's just in the South. It's everywhere. It's here too. People want people to not be engaged in the political process. And there are reasons for that. Because once you're engaged and involved in the political process, then you expect to not only have voice, but you expect to be responded to. There have been a multitude of studies done over the last few years about how laws reflect the constituents of politicians. And what they're finding is more and more laws are actually reflecting the needs and the desires of the donors as opposed to the constituents. This is something that we see nationwide. And Chicago, of course, is a microcosm of it. So how do we change that? We change it by electing people who are committed to democracy, are unabashedly, outwardly, outspoken about that, and place demands on them. There are a variety of ways to do things. People are talking about right now what bad shape Chicago is in financially, public safety-wise, public education-wise, whatever they want. There's this spin on where we are as a city, but also as citizens of this city and residents. So the question is, what is our responsibility as residents of this city to do? And our major responsibilities are to find candidates who believe in what we believe in. Participatory democracy requires work. This is not about one single election. This is about building a political infrastructure that resembles everyone and that speaks to everyone. Not one election and one office. If we're only looking at one election and one office, then we have narrowed our focus and it makes it even harder and harder and harder to demand accountability from our elected officials. So what I'm hoping is that people here are committed to a participatory democracy and that people here are committed to things like an elected representative school board. Transparency and accountability around the budget. Every single ward should have access to the information. Every single ward. And we should come together and say, you know what, this, this year, we're going to just focus on potholes, <laughs> OK? Or whatever you choose. Whatever you decide that's good for your ward. We're going to focus on that. Maybe next year we'll focus on something different. But if you're not part of the process, and if someone is just telling you, here's the plan, then when your services don't meet up to your standards, 
Who do you really have to complain to? Oh, somebody else made the plan. I wasn't in on that. And I think this notion of taking responsibility not just for voting, but for what happens after the election is something we can all agree that we need to work harder at. But those doors have been relatively closed to us. Even if you go talk to your alderman about an issue, you'll get a nice shake of the hand, thank you, we appreciate you took the time to come in, but do you always get follow through? Do you always get, but the good thing about having aldermen is you keep running into them in the grocery stores and the bookstores and things of that nature. So, but we have to have that same kind of participatory democracy across the city. That is the only thing that's going to change the political landscape. Or we will get people who are further and further and further out of touch with our needs. So again, this is about changing the political infrastructure. And if you're down for that, I think that you're someone who would vote for someone like me if I would choose to run. <laughs> So again, thank you all for coming out. And I guess Melissa has got a timer. And can I ask, I mean, normally I prefer that we have note cards. Now I understand that there's a reason you don't do this. I would like to get as many questions in as possible. And when we don't have note cards, my experience has been that people like to talk instead of ask a question, and then we get fewer questions answered, okay? So I have agreed to this more open system, and I would ask that when you ask a question, that it be very specific, and a question, and, and not a long story. Or right. Alyssa will take the mic I'll pull the mic away. <laughs> so this is your warning. If it's not a short question, I'm gonna cut you off. But come up to the mic, if you can, and uh, you come first and ask your question, and then... Hi, thank Hi. you for being here. The quality of education... Okay, can you tell me who you are? Yeah, My name is B. I live in the 46th Ward. The quality of education has varied widely across the city of Chicago, depending on your address. And that people who live in the poor or neighborhoods, or black neighborhoods tend to have more inferior uh, education through no fault of their own, despite Brown versus Board of Education 60 years ago. I know that concerns you, and it concerns me too, that I want all kids to get a great education like in Saga Nash School. So what are your plans and how would you address that, especially as a former teacher? Okay, first of all, you know, when you ask me what my plan is, my plan is the people's plan, okay? So elected representative school board first. Let's work towards that, okay? The second thing is we know what a good education looks like. You can come down to near where I live and go to the University of Chicago. You can go over to Francis Parker, not far from here. You can go down to the Latin School. You can see what a quality education looks like. It's highly resourced. There's small class sizes. There are children doing hands-on projects and living education, living school. We know what this is. Unfortunately, what we've been handed by corporate sponsors is this notion that our children can't learn unless they are being tamed, okay? Unless they have been put in a, um, an invisible straitjacket, unless they are quiet and compliant. That is not an education. That is training for low-wage jobs that these people plan to have for our children. So, so, since we know what a good education looks like, the key becomes, do we have the political will to work on getting equity into the system? Because that's what the problem is. It's an issue of equity. So, that takes political will. 
I'm actually going for the person who had her hand up first. Hi. Yeah, of course. Um, I heard you on the radio talk about a Chicago City Bank and the transaction tax. Can you tell me what you think, how those are for you? Sure. I mean, these are something that we've been talking about for some time. A financial transaction tax on the South Street, or the South Street tax, would generate for this state anywhere from 10 to 20 billion dollars. That kind of wipes out all the deficits that we would have. But there's a lot of pushback against it. There's also a national financial transaction tax that's being looked at. But again, the people that control the donor class also are the ones who are pushing back against this. So the, the key to this is that at some point, when does austerity stop for the rest of us? When does that stop? I mean, are, are, there, are we just gonna continue to go to the well with red light cameras and other kinds of regressive taxation that we already have, as opposed to looking at something infinitely more progressive? So we've been talking about that. We are going to have to find some creative solutions to the lack of revenue that is coming into this city, into this state. We cannot continue to do the stuff that we've been doing all along. That's not solving the problem. There are brilliant minds out here who have ideas about this, who have actually worked this out. We spent some time in the spring going to editorial boards, giving this stuff as an information to people, and giving the information behind it. Again, not rocket science, but it's not popular because everybody wants to fall back into the, well, we just have to raise property taxes. Because then that seems more quote unquote fair. And I think that's what people have been thinking for a long time. The only problem with, if you continue to raise property taxes and you do not provide people with appropriate services, you have a rebellion on your hands. Hi, my name is Christine, and I have a question around um, housing and homelessness. Uh, in the city, uh, we have had a 10-year plan to end homelessness. Our rates of homelessness have not gotten any better. Family homelessness in the city has gotten worse. Uh, that we have, um, at this point, all of the family shelters are full and have over 100 families living in an office building at this point because there's no more space. So what is your approach and thoughts around, around homelessness in our city and, and plans to, to end homelessness? Yes, well, interesting that you bring that up while the Lathrop homes have about 80% capacity, they're not being used. Not very far from here. So I'm not understanding why the Lathrop homes aren't being retooled. Excuse me. <coughs> so that some of those waiting families can come in. That's one piece. The other piece is clearly we need to have an incentive for developers to provide and maintain affordable housing. We, we just need to have that. However, for those who take advantage of city funds and whatnot that do not provide, then there needs to be some sort of uh, discussion about what else you owe us back, you know? And I do think that that's an issue that people want to brush under the rug because it's, un it's uncomfortable. And any of the uncomfortable questions get pushed off to the side, but we'll get to that. It's a matter of priorities. But we also know that these homeless families have students in what we call temporary living situations. So those are students who are most vulnerable and most needy, and again, these issues do not exist in silos. And one of the problems that we've seen is that people try to look at that as that's just simply a housing issue. But it's also a jobs issue. It's an education issue. It's all these issues that we have not found a way to appropriately link. That we're still trying to work on these issues in silos as if they are not inextricably linked. 
So I think that the issues become, how do we attack all of these at once? It's, it's a yes and answer. I want to make an announcement. We're not just taking questions from the center. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Hi, um, I'm Ryan. I live uh, here in Uptown, the 46th Ward. Um, since we have a political system that is ruled by money interests, it's dominated by a certain class of people, one thing that we've witnessed is that whenever a radical or somebody who's very critical gets elected into that political system, they're, um, they're, for, they're forced to, a lot of times they've compromised their initial beliefs. Um, and they've, they've sort of lost sort of the radical principles that um, have galvanized people around them. What, if you become elected, what would you do to prevent that from happening to you, where you wouldn't be confined to a politics of respectability within a system that's dominated by money interests and corporate interests? Well, I mean, it's just that I have a different point of view, period. I'm not surrounding myself by the folks that are in that class because their solutions haven't worked. I'm very interested in surrounding myself with people who are looking for critical, creative, innovative ways to solve these problems. So, I mean, I don't have an answer for you to say that tomorrow I'm going to be somebody different. I'm too old for that. I'm 61 years old. You know, who I am is set, and it's been set for a really long time. I'm also not interested in doing this job for the rest of my life, okay? So I'm not going to be needing to go back to these same people over and over and over again, begging them for money. So my situation's a little different. Now, I don't know about other folk, okay? But I can tell you about me. Um, I'm looking to jumpstart an entire new political movement. I'm expecting you to be able to take over, since you know this. I'm interested in, when people say to me, oh, well, you know, you're a Democrat, and they turn their nose up. Well, my attitude is, what have you done to create another viable party? Because that's not what we have now. So it's easy to sit and criticize, but until somebody is working to develop something else, an alternative, then, then it's talk, right? So what I'm saying is that I'm relying on people like you to take over the reins, okay? That's what has to happen. And then you need to ask and reflect on yourself, what are you going to do to not get sucked up into the vortex of money, power, and whatever, okay? Did I just flip the script on him? 22 years of teaching school, trust me. Was that Socratic enough? I'm not, I'm not offended. I'm not offended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um, I just want to ask you to comment on the relationship of the mental health movement, the attempt to reopen and even expand the public mental health clinics, how that relates to education, to housing, to jobs. Thank you. Thank you. I think the assault on the mental health clinics was one of the worst things I ever witnessed. And it was never something I expected to see, frankly. Um, my dearest friend in the entire world is a psychiatrist. And we have these conversations all the time about how important it is to have access to quality mental health care. And, and, and that's another issue around equity, that, you know, there are children who, for example, their parents have a big fight, they can go to therapy right away. You know, we have children who are suffering from PTSD, who have seen some really horrible things, and they don't have access to mental health care. And they are expected to do what everyone else is done, you know, like forget about it, don't think about it, just move on. These are kinds of things that are problematic. So I think there is a very, 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 very large group of people in this city who are dedicated to reopening those clinics and having them appropriately staffed. And I think that that is something 
that we should be able to support because it is absolutely necessary. I mean, asking people to get on two buses and an L to get to an appointment and not with the doctor or therapist that they had before is problematic. And it's cruel, quite frankly. I think we're better than that. I just think we're not a cruel society. At least I, w I need to believe that. doesn't work. It doesn't work. They don't even teach it in business school anymore. As a matter of fact, I was at a, um, at a, uh, a, a retreat, I guess that's the easiest way to describe it, at the Tuck Business School, which is the business school associated with Dartmouth, um, back in June. And um, they did case studies that are actually against command and control because command and control doesn't work because the people that you're supposed to be commanding and controlling have no voice, then they have no way to implement your policy. Because, it, especially if they don't believe in it. And I will say, the proudest moment for me during our strike was seeing all over the city, people sitting around reading that contract. I mean, those pictures are, indelibly, you know, meshed in my brain because to me that informs the process. So in order to do that here in Chicago, we have to have a real discussion around how the budgets work. So for each department, so for example, like CPS, when instead of them just coming up with a budget and saying here it is and giving people basically 24 hours to comment on it, why couldn't we be a part of the process of putting the budget together in the first place? They do that in Montgomery County, Maryland, which has one of the most equitable uh, school systems and school districts in the country. But guess who's at the table putting the budget together? The teachers union, the principals union, the support staff union, the PTA. All of those people work together with the superintendent to put their budget together. So then you can also go back and say to your people, this is what we have, what should our priorities be? Budgets are moral documents. And they set a pathway to what you believe is important and a priority. And this should be done across the board. It should be done across the board. And then you don't have so much animosity and anger. Collaboration, I know people don't think collaboration works. There are people that want to believe that leadership means I'm gonna say this and I'm the decider and blah, 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 and this is how it's gonna be. There are people that have bought into that, but where has that taken us? That doesn't work. So, the notion of participatory democracy means that we don't stop. We continue to build the capacity for democratic processes. And the people of the city want to work together. I have not been one place across the city where people thought that was a bad idea. Not one place. So. <laughs>
this form and a couple other key neighborhoods and cities of the issue of gentrification. This has been a neighborhood that uh, has historically been very racially and economically diverse. I think a lot of us who live here see that uh, changing, uh, seemingly by the way, here by the week. So um, for neighborhoods like uh, Uptown or Logan Square, which are gentrifying pretty rapidly, what, uh, what kind of policy do you uh, pursue to make sure that they stay? Okay, so I might get to the honorable refer to the question I just answered before. Me having a policy around gentrification is meaningless. What does the community think about gentrification? How would the community like to see this happen? I mean, theoretically, we ought to be able to write ordinances. Your legislators, your aldermen, should be able to craft any kind of ordinance they want. I mean, there are places all over the city that have a variety of ways of, do, of dealing with this. I mean, there were, there were um, issues back in the 60s around housing. I mean, about you know, segregation and how do, we, how do we absorb people into our communities so that we don't feel like we're being overwhelmed and we can stop white flight or a variety of things. They did, they did this throughout Beverly. They did this in other neighborhoods. But they had organizations within the neighborhoods that were willing to sit down and address these issues. But to say, what is your policy? My policy is, what do you want? What do you think will work? And let's craft that together. I am absolutely sure that that is the best way to design policy is in smaller groups like this, larger and larger and larger ones. Hi, Karen. Hi. <laughs> I'm Georgia. Hi, I've been, Georgia. I, I live in the gray city. Um, my concern is this. Every weekend, you listen to the news, you hear about 21 people being shot most of them young people. And I feel like they feel that our generation has primarily just said no, no, no. Um, my concern is this in regards to them. How do we bring them back into the fold? And how would you feel? Because not everybody is here to go to college. How would you feel about reinvesting in vocational schools again? and bringing in entrepreneurs, business people like plumbers, electricians, carpenters, to mentor these young people, possibly giving them internships, and giving them some hope again. Because right now they feel destitute and lost because nobody hears them. So how, how would you feel about going back and reinvesting in those vocational high schools that we used to have? Well, we used to have vocational education in every single high school. And then everything sort of became specialized. Now, I also notice when everything becomes specialized, you know, some people don't get access to services. So there are a couple of things that I think you're asking in this question. First of all, young people need something to do. Period. They need something to do. Um, a dear friend of mine used to say, you know, you have to have three things in life. You have to have something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. Those are your three basic needs that you have to have. And I think that we have, and I'm looking at my generation, I'm going to say my generation, the boomers, we have failed our young people in terms of providing safe space for them, such as what we had. When I was a kid, there were roller rinks all over the city, bowling alleys, things that children could do with their families. Those kinds of things have disappeared. And they've disappeared for a variety of reasons. But we, as a society, have to make a decision about what we should be offering. The other piece is the summer jobs have dried up. The jobs 
that youth used to have are now jobs that grown people trying to raise families have. You know, I mean, this is, this is our new reality, and this is, you know, our, our, uh, our lovely way of dealing with our economy now, is that people are working two and three jobs because they don't have the kind of coverage they need, they don't have the money to do things for their families the way they need to. So those entry-level jobs that used to go to teenagers are now very different. So we have also, and I think one of the things that I think that you mentioned is really important, and this is that we have also failed to mentor the next generation appropriately. You know, I hear about mentoring, but mentoring cannot just be haphazard. You lucky to get a mentor, you know. These are the kinds of things that we have to seriously consider Again, how do we decide what our priorities are? I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but access to the trades are extremely important for our youth. Hi, Ms. Lewis, good to see you again. My name is Floyd Tyrone Brutus, and I have a three-part question. If you decide to run, when you get back, on the first day, what's the one thing you would do? That's the first question. The second one, within a month of you being, after being elected, what's the one surprise that no one would have expected? Well, I can't tell you that, because there won't be a surprise. Okay, all right, no. so tell me. On day one, the first thing I would do is welcome people to Chicago. That Chicago is open for not only business, but Chicago is open for the people of this city. That's the first thing I want to do on day one. And, and that I'm going to work strongly with the city council to encourage um, participatory budgeting, participatory democracy on every single ward down to the block if at all possible. I mean, it's just that those are the things that we have to do to move this city forward. We are going to have to change the political landscape. It's going to have to look differently. It's going to have to feel differently. But what it's going to be more than anything else is that people start to feel empowered and part of the process. So that's within my first month. And the surprise, you'll see. Karen, uh, I'm Andy Thayer, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, speaking with those of us who don't have a few million dollars to actually make accounts. <laughs> I've lived in the city long enough to have seen mayoral candidate going back before Harold. Uh, every single mayoral candidate, unfortunately, pledges to hire more cops. And yet, of course, we've got a horrendous violence program, a problem not just now, but going back many decades for those of us who lived here. And what most of the Chicago's don't know is we've actually got the third highest per capita officer to civilian proportion of any city over 50,000 people here in the United States, according to the FBI in 2012. The number one and number two are D.C. and Baltimore uh, due to the uh, effect of being close to the federal government. And so I was frankly disturbed uh, the other day when I heard you uh, pledge to hire more police officers because I don't think that's really the way we deal with the violence program the problem in our city that we can are exhausted, okay? Because they're working lots and lots of overtime. We have a police force that is highly demoralized, okay? So I know people don't like to say, oh, more cops. That is not a solution. Hiring more cops gives us the opportunity to do several things. Number one, when our statistics and when our city was the safest, we had the strongest community policing program going. So look at the statistics.
statistics. That's when we had the least amount of uproar. I am for establishing relationships between the police department, our community organizations, where youth and police talk to each other, have conversations, build respect. This is about also developing relationships. So please, do not put me in the same category because I've said we need to hire more police because we need rested police officers too. Understand that's my issue. Not just putting folks on the street to like be a wave because that's not how crime gets solved. It's not. The problem is what we've got right now are people who fetishize technology. No camera came down off of a pole and stopped an altercation. No camera will ever do that. But real intelligence on the ground may not be able to stop that first shooting, but you can stop all the retaliatory ones if you have the number of people who have relationships with the other people so they can tell those folks, stay at home. All right, so I'm gonna push back on you because there are a variety of ways to deal with problems, but to have a police force that is exhausted to me and demoralized it's just one step. We have a variety of ways that we have to approach every single problem. And it's quite frankly, nothing should be off the table. When we start putting stuff off the table and say don't do this or don't do that, then that's when we box ourselves in. Let's get, again, I want a creative, innovative approach. And if that means adding more police, then we do that too. But we don't just say no, we're not gonna do it because somebody else said they were going to do it. And, and half of them don't do it anyway, because we certainly didn't see that happen in this last administration. We saw people moved around. But the real issue is that people need to feel safe. You cannot feel safe if we don't have trust and if we can't build relationships. You just cannot feel safe. I got to push back because uh, it's my position that we live in a police state in 1984 and it's in effect, uh, Cameron. I can't hear you speaking. Uh, I'm here. Oh, okay. I said, it seems that we're living in a police state in 1984 and it's in effect. In Chicago alone, there were 1,800 people who were murdered over the last three years. Only 26% of those were, 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 were caught. So that means there are 1,300 or 1,500 people running around Chicago who are murderers. That's what they're telling us. So I, I, I personally have a very serious problem with the Chicago Police Department. And I can read that the police we got $90,000 worth of overtime, but you can't catch the killers. And we won't talk about the other crimes. So I got a problem with the police because I think that there's a lot of corruption going on in the Chicago Police Department. As a young black person in my youth, I remember seeing how police jackets, and they're still jacking young black youth to this day. Real questions. I'm a, I, I do a map about participatory politics in Chicago. It was a redistricting map. And President, we're trying to go in the court to stop this election. And we would like to know if you'd be in support of stop this election because it's an illegal map that we presently exist under. This map denied one. Okay, and explain the map because most people don't understand democracy. They had an office downtown City Hall. I don't see too many citizens down there, but me and maybe three or four other people in this city. And redistricting affects the way money comes into our city. So I have to explain this so the community understands that the next mayor is going to deal with redistricting. It's coming up in 2019. If you go in 2015, you're going to be around when they draw those maps for the next time. So 1.6 million people were removed under daily in the black community. And so uh, they said that we had lost the population in the African American community and a, 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 a raising of the population in the uh, Hispanic community. But when I drew my map, and the Chicago City Council Black uh, Caucus drew their map, they both came up with 19. Now, the caucus backed up on their map because they kind of did. Some people became judges. So I want to know, I, what's I your position? I didn't, okay, wait a minute, can you, all right. I didn't hear what you just said. I can said, you? I said, in a redistricting map, there should have been 19 wards that were made for the African-American community. It was cut back to 18. There should have been 
more awards made, I think they gave them 11 or 13 awards made, 14 awards made for Latinos based on their population. They cut them back to 11. We have racial gerrymandering under Romney Manning. But it's so sophisticated because they back people off. So I want to know what is your position because I didn't see a lot of people with redistricting and the public participation was there. I didn't see nobody from CTU. I didn't see the people from who said they're progressives. They miss redistricting. It affects us, how money comes into the city. And as the mayor, you, are, you, you have to deal with all of these things. You have to deal with the school board, the park district, and all that. And all of it is affected by redistricting. So I want to know, what is your position? Would you be willing to support a suit to stop the election in 2015? Before you go, so, before you go, Ms. Ms. Lewis, we want to remind everybody: please get to the question. We don't, we don't need the, the dialogue. We can do that after the set. We want everybody to get a chance to ask the question. Get to the question. So um, I'm going to say no. I'm not going to support not having an election. Um, that to me is, um, I. I guess because I don't know this issue that you're talking about right now, about how the redistricting in terms of is, is in terms of that map that was drawn is either legal or illegal. Now, what I would be interested in doing is looking at what your lawsuit is. I'm always interested in that, about either changing the district or as opposed to, I'm, I guess I'm not understanding, I don't have enough information to make and give you an answer that would be clear, all right? Because I'm, I'm just hearing this basically for the first time from, from you. Hi, my name, my name is Tara, and I live in uptown. Um, I'm going to turn it on. Is that my one? Let's do this. It's ready. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Tara. And and um, I really liked the question that you asked um, the woman here was a letter carrier about. Uh, okay. right. Talk loud. Talk Can we hear you? I think I can talk loud. So yeah. I, it's Tara. I live in Uptown. <laughs> I really liked the question that the woman here asked was the letter carrier about participatory democracy. And I, I'm not going to say anything. About <laughs> about participatory democracy and I appreciated the answer that you gave regarding uh, your vision for what happens after you're elected should you run for mayor. Um, I was wondering if you could also address the part of your question that was about uh, the campaign itself because I'm really interested in that as well. How, what's going to be different about a Karen Lewis campaign should you choose to run and how, as she was asking, is it going to um, be a, like more participatory structure like you had in the... Okay, well the campaign is going to be the campaign. I will be honest with you, there's a science to winning campaigns now. You know, the campaign is not going to look a whole lot different from anybody else's campaign. I wish it could. It's not going to be a um, protest campaign or anything of that nature because those don't win elections. I mean, it's about science. It's about where the votes are. It's about communicating with people. It's about having conversations, big and small, and having those things done and bringing your points across. However, what the campaign will also include are a number of tables that provide input into building platforms. So that's going to always be there. So, I mean, if anybody that wants to participate in that, there will be someone here that can take your name down. Um, I'm looking at a couple in the back who are very interested in that. But in terms of the day-to-day -day structure of a campaign, they're gonna be run like every other campaign, all right? In terms of door knocking, in terms of, you know, the kinds of things that just need to be done. Just that's why we have a, a scientific way of approaching petitions. You can't just go out here and hope you'll get what you need. You have to actually have a plan. So I hope that, I hope that's meaningful. I hope that's it. But the campaign will not look particularly differently with the exception of the fact that we will have our policy table full of people that have expertise in these areas that help build these platforms.
Quick mic check, mic check, okay. Okay, hello, mic check. Hi, I'm Karen, how are you doing? My name is Jeff Littleton. Welcome to Uptown. I live in a neighborhood of Lars. I guess I have a question that I'm glad it didn't rain because when it rains, you get a big puddle in here. It's a good place. And that's why I can see the tiles all messed up. And um, so I'm going to give you a little question and then you sort of a short one, but it's about tiff reform because we were supposed to, six million dollars to take to get this up to code so it's not leaking. And this is the park district. But the only reason they could do it is with tiff money. And we had a mayor of it. So I'm talking about gentrification. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So anyway, so he's going to gentrification. How many like TIF funds used for gentrification? You don't need a gentrification policy, but would you be in favor of TIF funds for luxury housing, say 700 units of $2,000 one bedrooms, you know, like right here around the corner, that you're going to, you know, instead of fixing field houses, because that's what we got. So I, I think that the, the fixing of a field house is a perfect example of a good use of a TIF. There's no difference. Because this is for the entire community. Um, unfortunately, we live in a, in a time where every single development project has in its budget right now built in TIF funds that they're going to get from the city. They have built it into their budgets. That's, that is the reality right now. So the question then becomes, what does the community want? How does this work? And this is why in a participatory democracy and some disinfectant of sunshine around TIFs, we have an opportunity to have these different conversations. So the whole purpose of TIFs was designed to help blighted communities, right? It was designed but we've gotten to the point now where the only place we're seeing TIFs used are in places that probably don't need them. But now we've got people who have gotten used to the fact that this is what they're going to have access to. So I think that when the community responds to these kinds of projects, then things get changed. But things don't get changed if all the deals are made behind closed doors before the discussion's ever had. So, to me, fixing this field house so it doesn't flood, and then using, utilizing the space to have these conversations about, here's a project, here's a project, here's a project, participatory democracy, we voting or not? Um, I'd like to know what your position is on the mayor's SRO ordinance. I don't know what the mayor's SRO ordinance is. I've heard like three different stories about what it is, that it sort of phases out, it phases in. I'm not sure what his ordinance is. But I do know that we have to have affordable housing in every single neighborhood. We just have to have it. We have to have places for people to live. So, I have no idea what his ordinance is. I didn't know mayors wrote ordinances. I actually thought that was the work of the alderman. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bruce Crosby from the 21st Ward. Uh, I find it shocking that you would tell us about just for democracy and not be aware of the racial gerrymandering has taken place in this city against the black and Hispanic community. As Mr. Cross reported out to you, the black community was short of war when they drew a map. The Latino community was short of war when they drew a map. And the voting rights of black and Hispanic citizens across this city have been violated. And to run for mayor and to say you're talking about participatory democracy, and not being aware of the racial gerrymandering to me was a problem. Okay. I'm so sorry, but if I don't know something, I'm not going to sit up here and make something up for you. I'm not aware, and I am not aware of the details. So for me to have a, real, a reasonable answer for you, I need to have more details. Now, I heard something about this when it happened, 
But I also saw no groundswell, and, as, and he said, people were not there. So, again, I apologize that I'm absolutely not perfect and know everything, but that's why I'm here to learn. That was the beauty of coming out to community after community, is to learn. It's like, for me to start, if I had all the answers to begin with, then I would be like everybody else. That's command and control. So I hope you appreciate the fact that not only am I here to learn, I will follow up and do some studying on it, but I'm not gonna comment on something that I'm not fully briefed on. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ms. Lewis, I'm a concerned citizen of Chicago. Got a question. With a name? Oh, my name is Adam. Are you an attorney? No. That's good. Where everybody knows, all our politicians are attorneys, which most no. of the majority of them and they will put the best for you out there. You know, you look at the city, you look at the city and how it has deteriorated, you know, and I just want to know what would you do to make it much better than what it is, and I just got to say, you know, we keep voting for, for garbage, you know, why not trash? We need to change it. Stop recycling, because I'm quite sure everybody in this room have every bear get elected in 40 years. If you don't like having changed in 40 years, there's something wrong. So I absolutely agree with you 100%. Uh, are we better off now than we were four years ago? Is the city better off now? Again, I'm interested in two things. Creative, innovative, participatory approach to municipal government. Because I believe that it's easy for us to sit here and complain about things that have gone wrong, but it's much harder to be part of the solution. But that means that we have to hold our elected officials accountable. And it's not just every four years. We have to hold them accountable on a regular basis. I have seen members of the General Assembly, and I have seen aldermen run from their constituents. I've actually seen this with my own eyes, them run from their constituents. And I think we need to have way more pressure on people like that who are running away from their constituents than run out, go away, you know? So I tend to agree with you that we need to have, but the pressure needs to be regularly. All right, um, we have time for two more questions. Hi, Karen, my name is Michael. Hi, Michael. Welcome to Uptown, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. We love having you here. Uh, I'm a college student, I'm a college senior. I have a question about, um, I, I have noticed income inequality in our city since I've lived here, since 97. I look at what New York City is doing with the millionaire's tax. Is that something that, should you be elected? And I think, I'm praying that you will, because we need a mayor who cares. Um, is that something that you would support or look into? How are your feelings um, well, surrounding that issue? Look, the problems of inequity are so huge, not just in this city, but in the country. So we have to find a way to make those things less of an issue, okay? But what I will say to you is that I'm more interested in addition than I am in subtraction. So to me, addition means bringing more people to the problem, bringing more ideas to the problem, and, and having creative ways of solving them. That you can't do by just saying, okay, I'm gonna take your money from here and give it over there, right? Because if people are like, uh-uh, you know, that's, I don't know, what do they say? That's socialism, that's communism, that's something. Whatever, they, whatever ism they're into this week. So the issue becomes, how do we provide incentives for people to want to do the right thing is what, comes, what this comes down to. How do we make the space positive for those things to happen? And it happens from addition, again, not subtraction. Okay. I'm Joyce Pope Lightfoot. And I know who you are. <laughs> and I have, not, I have 
I like to be a bride of no show to say that I have raised Carrie. That's true. And she, she comes from a very small, educated family who has very good principles, and I'm very proud of her. And I just like to say that I, I go along with her coalescence of people to get them together for participatory democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. All right, she's known me my entire life. That on the police, we have a city that, especially in pockets, has a very high violence rate. And then we also have a police force that um, ends up paying out a huge amount of money due to police misconduct. And as I think society is figuring out, that the police are only paying out on a small fraction of the cases where misconduct is involved. And so my question is, what is professional policing to you? Well, I think it starts with appropriate training from the very beginning. I mean, there, there's so many issues. There, I wish that this would, I had a simple answer for you, okay? Because then we could wave that magic wand and all these problems would be solved, right? But the key comes down to appropriate training, recruitment, and what we do in our communities and how we interact with police. The police are not by themselves over here, right? We have to figure out this way of how do we interact with police appropriately. And when I say that, I'm not talking about compliance. I'm not talking about you know the notion of we should just say yes or no, sir. I have a very good friend who's a police officer that told me that there's certain parts of town where you cannot police people because they'll just say, I'm, I'm giving you a ticket, and they'll take the ticket and tear it up and throw it in the police officer's face. So, so, but that won't probably happen in my neighborhood, okay? And probably in some places around here that won't happen. However, it does happen in other places. So, the key becomes how do we all work together to change this notion of as this brother said over here, some occupying force, but that we have at the ground level the notion of what public safety means and how, how it relates to everyone, regardless of your zip code, regardless of your, of your, of your demographic. So, Again, these are issues that have to come together. So it's about training and working together and having our expectations clear. I mean, I think the problem is that we haven't had any real dialogue or discussion. We just are always there at the end of some tragedy. And then we come in with this isn't working. So the, the key is how do we start to move away from that, okay? And how do we make our community safer? So I think that's always important. 